Greetings, bookworms, and welcome to the Bearded Book Club's production of The Color of Magic by Terry Pratchett. If you want to follow along in this and all of our productions, make sure you subscribe to the channel and turn on your notifications so you will be notified of all new videos as well as when we do our live shows. If you would like to support Bearded Book Club, you could do so in two ways, both of which are listed in this video's description. Number one, you could become a Patreon and support us on a regular basis. Or number two, you can go to our Amazon wish list and send us a book as a one-time donation. So without further ado, let us continue. At the very edge of the city and country of Kroll was a large semicircular amphitheater with seating for several tens of thousands of people. The arena was only semicircular for the very elegant reason that it overlooked the cloud sea that boiled up from the rimfall. Far below, and now every seat, was occupied, and the crowd was growing restive. It had come to see a double sacrifice and also the launching of a great bronze spaceship. Neither event had yet materialized. The arch-astronomer beckoned the master launch controller to him. Well, he said, filling a mere four letters with a full lexicon of anger and menace, the master launch controller went pale. No news, lord, said the launch controller, and added with a brittle brightness, except that your prominence will be pleased to hear that Gahartra has recovered. That is a fact he may come to regret, said the arch-astronomer. Yes, lord. How much longer do we have? The launch controller glanced at the rapidly climbing sun. Thirty minutes, your prominence. After that, Kroll will have revolved away from Great Atuin's tail, and the potent voyager will be doomed to spin around, spin away into the Terrapine Gulf. I have already set the automatic controls, so... All right, all right, the arch-astronomer said, waving him away. The launch must go ahead. Maintain the watch on the harbor, of course. When the wretched pair are caught, I will personally take a great deal of pleasure in executing them myself. Yes, lord, er... Uh, the arch-astronomer frowned. What else have you got to say, man? The launch controller swallowed. All this was very unfair on him. He was a practical magician rather than a diplomat, and that was why some wiser brains had seen to it that he would be the one to pass on the news. A monster has come out of the sea, and it's attacking the ships in the harbor, he said. A runner just arrived from there. A big monster, said the arch-astronomer. Not particularly, although it is said to be exceptionally fierce, lord. The ruler of Kroll and the circumference considered this for a moment, then shrugged. The sea is full of monsters, he said. It is one of the prime attributes. Have it dealt with and master launch controller, lord. If I am further vexed, you will recall that two people are due to be sacrificed. I may feel generous and increase the number. Yes, lord, the master launch controller scuttled away, relieved to be out of the autocrat's sight. The potent voyager, no longer the blank bronze shell that had been smashed from the mold a few days earlier, rested in its cradle on top of a wooden tower in the center of the arena. In front of it, a railway ran down toward the edge, where the space of a few yards it turned suddenly upward. The late Dactylos Golden Eyes, who had designed the launching pad, as well as the potent voyager itself, had claimed that this last touch was merely to ensure that the ship would not snag on any rocks as it began its long plunge. Maybe it was merely coincidental that it would also, because of that little twitch in the track, leap like a salmon and shine theatrically in the sunlight before disappearing into the cloud sea. There was a fanfare of trumpets at the edge of the arena. The Chelinot's honor guard appeared to much cheering from the crowd. Then the white-suited explorers themselves stepped out into the light. It appeared dawn it immediately dawned on the arch astronomer that something was wrong. Heroes always walked in a certain way, for example. They certainly didn't waddle, and one of the Chelonauts was definitely waddling. The roar of the assembled people of Kroll was deafening, as the Chelonauts and their guards crossed the great arena, passing between the many altars that had been set up for the various wizards and priests of Kroll's many sects to ensure the success of the launch, the arch-astronomer frowned. By the time the party was halfway across the floor, his mind had reached a conclusion. By the time the Chelonauts were standing at the foot of the ladder that led to the ship, and was there more than a hint of reluctance about them? The arch-astronomer was on his feet, his words lost in the noise of the crowd. 
One of his arms shot out and back, fingers spread dramatically in the traditional spell-casting position, and any passing lip-reader who was also familiar with the standard text of magic would have recognized the opening words of Vest Cake's floating curse and would then have prudently run away. Its final words remained unsaid, however. The arch-astronomer turned in astonishment as a commotion broke out around the big arched entrance to the arena. Guards were running out into the daylight, throwing down their weapons as they scuttled among the altars or vaulted the parapet into the stands. Something emerged behind them, and the crowd around the entrance ceased its ruckus cheering and began a silent, determined scramble to get out of the way. The something was a low dome of seaweed moving slowly but with a sinister sense of purpose. One guard overcame his horror sufficiently to stand in its path and hurl his spear, which landed squarely among the weeds. The crowd cheered, then went deathly silent as the dome surged forward and engulfed the man completely. The arch-astronomer dismissed the half-formed shape of Vescake's famous curse with a sharp wave of his hand, and quickly spoke the words of one of the most powerful spells in his repertoire, the Infernal Combustion Enigma. Octarine fire spiraled around in between his fingers as he shaped the complex rune of the spell in midair and sent it screaming and trailing blue smoke towards the shape. There was a satisfying explosion and a gout of flame shot up into the clear morning sky, shedding flakes of burning seaweed on the way. A cloud of smoke and steam concealed the monster for several minutes, and when it cleared the dome, had completely disappeared. There was a large charred circle on the flagstones, however, in which a few clumps of kelp and bladder rack still smoldered. And in the center of the circle was a perfectly ordinary, if somewhat large, wooden chest. It was not even scorched. Someone on the far side of the arena started to laugh, but the sound was broken off abruptly as the chest rose up on dozens of what could only be legs and turned to face the arch-astronomer. A perfectly ordinary, if somewhat large, wooden chest does not, of course, have a face with which to face, but this one was quite definitely facing. In precisely the same way as he understood that, the arch-astronomer was also horribly aware that this perfectly normal box was in some indescribable way narrowing its eyes. It began to move resolutely toward him. He shuddered. Magicians, he screamed. Where are my magicians? Around the arena, pale-faced men peeped out from behind altars and under benches. One of the bolder ones, seeing the expression on the arch-astronomer's face, raised an arm tremulously and essayed a hasty thunderbolt. It hissed toward the chest and struck it squarely in a shower of white sparks. That was the signal for every magician, enchanter, and thaumaturgist and kroll to leap up eagerly and under the terrified eyes of their master unleash the first spell that came to each desperate mind. Charms curved and whistled through the air. Soon the chest was lost to view again in an expanding cloud of magical particles which billowed out and wreathed in its twisting, disquieting shapes. Spell after spell screamed into the melee, flame and lightning bolts of all eight colors stabbed out brightly from the seething thing that now occupied the space where the box had been. Not since the Mage Wars had so much magic been concentrated on one small area. The air itself wavered and glittered. Spell ricocheted off spell, creating short-lived wild spells whose brief half-life was both weird and uncontrolled. The stones under the heaving mass began to buckle and split. One of them, in fact, turned into something best left undescribed and slunk off into some dismal dimension. Other strange side effects began to manifest themselves. A shower of small lead cubes bounced out of the storm and rolled across the heaving floor, and eldritch shapes gibbered and beckoned obscenely. Four-sided triangles and double-ended circles ended momentarily before merging again into the booming, screaming tower of runaway raw magic that boiled up from the molten flagstones and spread out over Krull. It no longer mattered that most of the magicians had ceased their spellcasting and fled. The thing was now feeding on the streams of octarine particles that were always at their thickest near the edge of the disk. Throughout the island of Krull, every magical activity failed as all the available mana in the area was sucked into the cloud, <clears throat> which was already a quarter of a mile high and streaming out into mine-curdling shapes. 
Hydrophobes on their sea-skimming lenses crashed screaming into the waves. Magic potions turned to mere impure water in their files. Magical swords melted and dripped from their scabbards. But none of this in any way prevented the thing at the base of the cloud, now gleaming mirror bright in the intensity of the power storm around it, from moving at a steady walking pace toward the arch astronomer. Rincewind and Twoflower watched in awe from the shelter of potent Voyager's launch tower. The honor party had long since vanished, leaving their weapons scattered behind them. Well, sighed Twoflower at last, there goes the luggage, he sighed. Don't you believe it, said Rincewind. Sapient Pearwood is totally impervious to all known forms of magic. It's been constructed to follow you anywhere. I mean, when you die, if you go to heaven, you'll at least have a clean pair of socks in the afterlife. But I don't want to die yet, so let's just get going, shall we? Where, said Two Flower. Rincewind picked up a crossbow and a handful of corals. Anywhere that isn't here, he said. What about the luggage? Don't worry, when the storm has used up all the free magic in the vicinity, it'll just die out. In fact, that was already beginning to happen. The billowing cloud was still flowing up from the area, but now it had a tenuous, harmless look about it. Even as two flowers stared, it began to flicker uncertainly. Soon it was a pale ghost. The luggage was now visible as a squat shape among the almost invisible flames. Around it, the rapidly cooling stones began to crack and buckle. Two flower called softly to his luggage. It stopped its stolid progress across the tortured flags and appeared to be listening intently. Then, moving its dozens of feet in an intricate pattern, it turned on its length and headed toward the potent voyager. Rincewind watched it sourly. The luggage had an elemental nature, absolutely no brain, a homicidal attitude toward anything that threatened its master, and he wasn't quite sure that its insides occupied the same space-time framework as its outside. Not a mark on it, said Two Flower cheerfully as the box settled down in front of him. He pushed open the lid. This is a fine time to change your underwear, snarled Rincewind. In a minute, all those guards and priests are going to come back, and they're going to be upset, man. <coughs> water, murmured Two Flower. The whole box is full of water. Rincewind peered over his shoulder. There was no sign of clothes, money bags, or any of the tourists' belongings. The whole box was full of water. A wave sprang up from nowhere and lapped over the edge. It hit the flagstones, but instead of spreading out, began to take the shape of a foot. Another foot and a bottom half of a pair of legs followed a more water stream down as it filled an invisible mold. A moment later, Tethys the sea troll was standing in front of them, blinking. I see, he said at last, you two. I suppose I shouldn't be surprised. He looked around, ignoring their astonished expressions. It was just sitting outside my hut watching the sunset when this thing came roaring out of the water and swallowed me, he said. I thought it was rather strange. Where is this place? Crawl, said Rincewind. He stared hard at the now closed luggage, which was managing to project a smug expression. Swallowing people was something it did quite frequently, but always when the lid was next opened, there was nothing inside but two flowers laundry. Savagely, he wrenched the lid up. There was nothing inside but two flowers laundry. It was perfectly dry. Well, well, said Tethys. He looked up. Hey, he said, isn't this the ship they're going to send over the edge? Isn't it? It must be. An arrow zipped through his chest, leaving a faint ripple, but didn't appear. he didn't appear to notice. Rincewind did. Soldiers were beginning to appear at the edge of the arena, and a number of them were peering around the entrances. Another arrow bounced off the tower behind Two Flower. At this range, the bolts did not have a lot of force, but it would only be a matter of time. Quick, said Two Flower, into the ship. They won't dare fire at that. I knew you were going to suggest that, groaned Rincewind. I just knew it. He aimed a kick at the luggage. It backed off a few inches and opened its lid threateningly. A spear arced out of the sky and trembled to a halt in the woodwork by the wizard's ear. He screamed briefly and scrambled up the ladder after the others. Arrows whistled around them as they came out onto the narrow catwalk that led along the spine of the potent voyager. Two Flower led the way, jogging along with what Rincewind considered to be too much suppressed excitement. Atop the center of the ship was a large, round, bronze hatch with hasp around it. The troll and the tourist knelt down and started to work on them. 
In the heart of the potent Voyager, fine sand had been trickled into a carefully designed cup for several hours. Now the cup was filled by exactly the right amount to dip down and upset a careful balanced weight. The weight swung away, pulling a pin from an intricate little mechanism. A chain began to move. There was a clonk. What was that? said Rincewin urgently. He looked down. The hail of arrows had stopped. The crowd of priests and soldiers were standing motionless, staring intently at the ship. A small worried man elbowed his way through them and started to shout something. What was that? said Two Flower, busy with a wing nut. I thought I heard something, said Rincewin. Look, he said. We'll threaten to damage the thing if they don't let us go, right? That's all we're going to do, right? Yeah, said Two Flower vaguely. He sat back on his heels. That's it, he said. It ought to lift off now. Several muscular men were swarming up the ladder to the ship. Rincewind recognized the two chelonauts among them. They were carrying swords. I he began. The ship lurched. Then with infinite slowness it began to move along the rails. In that moment of black horror, Rincewind saw that two flower and the troll had managed to pull the hatch up. A metal ladder inside led into the cabin below. The troll disappeared. We've got to get off, whispered Rincewind. Two flower looked at him, a strange mad smile on his face. Stars, said the tourist, worlds, the whole damned sky full of worlds, places no one will ever see, except me. He stepped through the arch hatchway. You're totally mad, said Rincewind hoarsely, trying to keep his balance on the ship, as the ship began to speed up. He turned as one of the Chelonauts tried to leap the gap between the Voyager and the tower, landed on the curving flank of the ship, scrambled for an instant for purchase, failed to find any, and dropped away with a shriek. The Voyager was traveling quite fast now. Rincewing could see past Two Flowers' head to the sunlit cloud sea and the impossible rainbow floating tantalizingly beyond it, beckoning fools to venture too far. He also saw a gang of men climbing desperately over the lower slopes of the launching ramp and manhandling a large bulk of timber onto the track in a frantic attempt to derail the ship before it vanished over the edge. The wheels slammed into it, but the only effect was to make the ship rock. Two Flower uh, to lose his grip on the ladder and fall into the cabin, and the hatch to slam down with the horrible sound of a dozen fiddly little catches snapping into place. Rincewind dived forward and scrambled at them, whimpering. The cloud sea was much nearer now. The edge itself, a rocky perimeter to the arena, was startlingly close. Rincewind stood up. There was only one thing to do now, and he did it. He panicked blindly just as the ship's boogies hit the little upgrade and flung it, sparkling like a salmon, into the sky and over the edge. A few seconds later there was a thunder of a little feet and the luggage cleared the rim of the world, legs still pumping determinedly and plunging down into the universe. The End Rincewind woke up and shivered. He was freezing cold. So this is it, he thought. When you die, you go to a cold, damp, misty, freezing place. Hades, where the mournful spirits of the dead troop forever across the sorrowful marshes, corpse lights flickering fitfully in the encircling... Hang on a minute. Surely Hades wasn't this uncomfortable. And he was very uncomfortable indeed. His back ached where a branch was pressing into it, his legs and arms hurt where the twigs were lacerate, had lacerated them, and judging by the way his head was feeling, something hard had recently hit it. If this was Hades, it sure was hell. Hang on a minute. Tree. He concentrated on the word that floated up from his mind, although the buzzing in his ears and the flashing lights in front of his eyes made this an unexpected achievement. Tree. Wooden thing. That was it. Branches and twigs and things and Rincewind lying in it, tree, dripping wet, cold, white cloud all around, underneath too. Now that was odd. He was alive and lying covered in bruises in a small thorn tree that was growing in a crevice in the rock that projected out of the foaming white wall that was the rimfall. The realization hit him in much the same way as an icy hammer. He shuddered. The tree gave a warning creak. Something blue and blurred shot past him, dipped briefly into the thundering waters, and whirred back and settled on a branch near Rincewind's head. 
It was a small bird with a tuft of blue and green feathers. It swallowed the little silver fish that had snatched from the fall and eyed him curiously. Rincewin became aware that there was a lot of similar birds around. They hovered, darted, and swooped easily across the face of the water, and every so often one would raise an extra plume of spray as it stole another doomed morsel from the waterfall. Several of them were perching in the tree. They were as iridescent as jewels. Rincewin was entranced. He was in fact the first man ever to see the rim fishers, the tiny creatures who had long ago evolved a lifestyle quite unique even for the disc. Long before the Crowleyans had built the circumference, the rim fishers had devised their own efficient method of policing the edge of the world for a living. They didn't seem bothered about Rincewind. He had a brief but chilling vision of himself living the rest of his life out on this tree, subsisting on raw birds and such fish as he could snatch as they plummeted past. The tree moved distinctly. Rincewind gave a whimper as he found himself sliding backwards, but managed to grab a branch. Only sooner or later he would fall asleep. There was a subtle change of scene, a slight purplish tint to the sky. A tall, black-cloaked figure was standing at the air in the air next to the tree. It had a scythe in one hand. Its face was hidden in the shadows of the hood. I have come for thee, said the invisible mouth, in tones of heavy, as heavy as the whale's heartbeat. The trunk of the tree gave another protesting creak, and a pebble bounced off Rincewind's helmet as one root tore loose from the rock. Death himself always came in person to harvest the souls of wizards. What am I going to die of, said Rincewind. The tall figure hesitated. Pardon, it said. Well, I haven't broken anything, and I haven't drowned, so what am I about to die of? You can't just be killed by death. There has to be a reason, said Rincewind. To his utter amazement, he didn't feel terrified anymore. For about the first time in his life, he wasn't frightened. Pity the experience didn't look like lasting for long. Death appeared to reach a conclusion. You could die of terror, the hood intoned. The voice still had its graveyard ring, but there was a slight tremor of uncertainty. Won't work, said Rincewind smugly. There doesn't have to be a reason, said Death. I can just kill you. Hey, you can't do that. It'd be murder. The cowed figure sighed and pulled back its hood. Instead of the grinning death's head that Rincewind had been expecting, he found himself looking up into the pale and slightly transparent face of a rather worried demon of sorts. I'm making rather a mess of this, aren't I? It said wearily. You're not death. Who are you? cried Rincewind. Scruffula. Scruffula! Death couldn't come, said the demon wretchedly. There's a big plague on in Pseudopolis. He had to go and stalk the streets, so he sent me. No one dies of scruffula. I've got rights. I'm a wizard. All right, all right. This was going to be my big chance, said scruffula. But look at it this way. If I hit you with this scythe, you'll be just as dead as if it would be death and had done it. Who'd know? I'd know, snapped Rincewind. You wouldn't. You'd be dead, said scruffula logically. Piss off, said Rincewind. That's all very well, said the demon, hefting the scythe, but why not try to see things from my point of view? This means a lot to me, and you've got to admit that your life isn't all that wonderful. Reincarnation can only be an improvement. Um. His hand flew to his mouth, but Rincewind was already pointing a trembling finger at him. Reincarnation, he said excitedly, so it is true what the mystics say. I'm admitting nothing, said Scrofula testily. It was a slip of the tongue. Now are you going to die willingly or not? No, said Rincewind. Please yourself, replied the demon. He raised the scythe. It whistled down in quite a professional way, but Rincewind wasn't there. He was in fact several meters below, and the distance was increasing all the time. Because the Brants had chosen that moment to snap and send him on his interrupted journey toward the interstellar gulf. Come back, screamed the demon. Rincewind didn't answer. He was lying belly down on, on the rushing air, staring down into the clouds that even now were thinning. They vanished. Below the whole universe twinkled at Rincewind. There was great Atuin, huge and ponderous and pocked with craters. There was the little disk moon. There was a distant gleam that could only be the potent voyager. 
and there were all the stars, looking remarkably like powdered diamonds spilled with on black velvet. The stars that lured and ultimately called the boldest toward them. The whole of creation was waiting for Rincewind to drop in. He did so. There didn't seem to be any alternative. We hope you've enjoyed this production of The Color of Magic by Terry Pratchett. If you enjoyed this book, please show the author support by buying a copy of this novel. A link where you can purchase a copy is listed in the description of this video. Until next story, bookworms. God bless you.